The Shia population in India today accounts to over 45 million, making it the world's second largest Shia population after Iran. There are many towns and villages with a majority of Shia population, and around a tenth of the overall Shia population comprising of Sayyids. Many of these Sayyids migrated to the Indian subcontinent between the 11th and 16th century to escape the persecution they were facing as direct descendants of the Prophet. My name is Imran Imam. My maternal grandfather was the last Raja of Mahmudabad, whose task was to promote cultural aspects of all religions, including Islam, in the Middle East and in the subcontinent of India. History records that the first movement of Shia Muslims to India dates back to the period of the Holy Prophet himself, with merchant communities and traders journeying far and wide, some settling and bringing with them their faiths and practices. This continued after the demise of the Prophet. It has been narrated that half a century before the Hanafi Muslim conquerors of northern India arrived, their ancestors had embraced Islam at the hands of Imam Ali. Reports claim that the Imam made a covenant with them that was passed down to each ruler. We are told that they adopted the Shia faith and had love for the Ahlul Bayt deeply rooted in their hearts. Over the years, however, their descendants deviated from Shia faith and opted for Hanafi Sunni faith. Legend has it that during a visit to the northern Indian regions, Imam Ali left a handprint which can be found in modern-day Hyderabad. Whilst no formal conquest took place, some historians claim that Arab armies during the Caliphate Imam Ali crossed the Sindh frontiers, which led to the Jats of Sindh developing a deep devotion to the Imam, some even attributing divinity to him. Such sporadic entrances continued over the decades, until the initial Muslim conquests of India under the Umayyad general Muhammad ibn Qasim. He invaded Sindh and Multan following a series of attacks into Muslim territories. Couple this with centuries of trade and migration and you have the beginnings of what would be termed a satellite state in the Deccan region of India, where the political climate in Arabia had a direct impact on these settler communities. The Shia communities in particular featured prominently in these migrations particularly those of the descendants of the Prophet and his family, who were escaping continuous persecution at the hands of both the Umayyads and the Abbasids. One of the largest migrations was during the rule of Hajjaj ibn Yusuf al thaqafi who oppressed and killed the Shias in large numbers. Those that could escape, particularly the Sadat, traveled towards the subcontinent. when Al-Hajjaj ibn Yusuf al thaqafi ruled Iraq. He unleashed a reign of terror uh, specifically on the followers of the school of Ahlul Bayt which prompted them to migrate and spread out. Many went to Iran and a group among them are said to have come to uh, India. And in fact the raid of Muhammad ibn al-Qasim, the attack of Muhammad ibn al-Qasim uh, on India in 711 one of the motivations for that uh, attack is said to have been the fact that Al-Hajjaj recognized that India had become a sort of a safe haven for many of the followers of the school of Ahlul Bayt who had migrated 
and was had settled in India. It is said that it is during the uh, uh, late uh, Umayyad and early Abbasid period itself that the Shi'is started making their entry into the region of Sindh. And it is said that uh, one of the Hindu kings, in fact, helped them uh, against the persecution which was taking place against the Shias. Uh, and they uh, were sheltered here. And it was due to that that King Dahar, in fact, lost his kingdom by defending uh, the Shias uh, who had migrated here. And uh, these Shias who had migrated here, it is said regarding them that uh, they were the Sayyids belonging to the family of the Ahle Bayt. Another flashpoint in the history of uh, migration is the year 656. This is basically the end of the Abbasid period, when Baghdad was ransacked by Halaku and his armies. So a lot of people uh, were massacred and slaughtered, and uh, basically Holaku then moved on into Iran. And as he began to gain influence there, people fled for their lives. Many of the followers of the school of Ahlul Bayt living in Iran, in Isfahan, in Shiraz, they migrated to, to India. So a lot of the migration that you see to India for the followers of the school of Ahlul Bayt, they were looking for a safe haven. They were looking for a place where they would be allowed to freely practice their faith as they saw it without the fear of state-sponsored oppression. By the 10th century, the Ismailis, an offshoot of the Shia Imamid community, established the Fatimid dynasty. There was much political rivalry between the Fatimids and the Abbasids who sent troops to topple Multan and rule the region. The Fatimids in turn sent a delegation to Multan to seek power in the region. Following much conflict and difficulty, the Fatimids managed to seize power after which they ruled Multan. The Friday sermons that were recited in the region were in accordance to those in the Fatimid Caliphate in Cairo. We also come to know that coins were minted on the pattern of the Egyptian coins, further confirming the Shia influence within the region. It is also said that the locals assumed the Shia faith and restored Hayya ala Khair al-Amal to the call of prayer. Over the next few decades, the Ismaili leadership continued to develop in the subcontinent. However, they would come under constant attack from the Ghaznavids, a Sunni dynasty of Persian descent. The Ghaznavid had no problem employing Ismailis into their political spheres allowing them to continue practicing their faith as they pleased. This marked the beginning of the Persian entrance into their region, which again brought with it Shias from Persian lands who settled in the Deccan Multan regions. We come to know that uh, in the latter President White period, or uh, at the time when the Ghurids uh, uh, make an entry into the country, uh, uh, when uh, the invasions by Muizuddin bin Sam started occurring, it was during that period that the Ismailis of Multan, they were suppressed. But before they were suppressed, we also get an information that they had their own Jama Masjid in the city of uh, you know, Multan and the Azan would be given uh, from that Masjid openly without any taqayya or anything. Mu'izuddin ibn Sam continued to establish his kingdom taking Delhi and large swathes of northern India, including Deccan regions, until he was assassinated, after which one of his trusted generals, Qutbuddin Aybak, assumed power becoming the first Sultan of Delhi. The Delhi Sultanate was a Muslim kingdom that stretched over large parts of the Indian subcontinent spanning a period of 320 years. Mass migration of Muslims from various parts of the Muslim world moved to India in this period, including those with mystical Sufi backgrounds. <laughs> The spread of Shi'ism was cultivated by the influence of Sufi saints who preached about the Imams and their merits. With the history evolving over 1000 years in India, it is said that mystic traditions became widely visible during the 10th century of the Delhi Sultanate. 
More prominent Sufi saints emerged in the 12th century with people like Moinuddin Chisti moving to India during this period. Moinuddin Chisti was the founder of the Chisti order and a direct descendant of the Prophet. He normalized the superiority of the Ahlul Bayt and was particularly influential in converting Hindus to Islam. I have no doubt that many of them, if not all, were Shias in Taqiyya, the Sufi masters. And you can watch from there, as you have seen, from their, their uh, visit to their tombs and from their books. Amoinuddin Chisti is buried in what is known as Ajmer today. His shrine, the Ajmer Sharif Dargah, is situated at the foot of the Taragal Hill, consisting of several white marble buildings arranged around two courtyards. It is estimated that around 125,000 pilgrims visit the site every day. Historical accounts tell us that in close proximity to Moinuddin Chisti's Dargah, at the top of Targar Hill, lies one of the first Imam Bargahs in India, situated near the Targar Fort. While Sufis propagated a metaphorical esoteric understanding of Islam, there emerged movements which also held a literalist totalitarian ideology. One of the greatest Delhi Sultanates emerges during the reign of Tughlaqs, founded by Firoz Shah Tughlaq, a staunch Sunni who persecuted the Shia and the Ismailis. We come to know that during uh, the Tughlaq period, uh, especially during the reign of uh, Firoz Shah Tughlaq, the persecution of the Shias started in right earnest in the country. Many of the Shias who had migrated to the regions were now forced to practice taqayya, permissible concealment of their faith, to safeguard their lives. During the same period, Muhammad ibn Tughlaq, son of the founder of the Tughlaq dynasty, marched south of Delhi to take control of the Deccan region. He appointed Alauddin Bahman Shah to take charge of the region. With a new growing population of Muslims, the Deccan continued to rise in prominence while the influence of the Tughlaqs in Delhi began to decline. By 1347, Alauddin Bahman Shah decided to revolt and claim independence, establishing his own Sultanate. This dynasty was first to introduce Shia tendencies into the Deccan in a significant form. While they openly professed to be Sunni, some historians believe there may have been elements who were Shia living under Taqayya. The Bahmani Sultans had a close association with the descendants of the Sufi master Shah Na'matullah Wali, who successfully promoted the Wilaya of Imam Ali as the master of all Sufi paths, as well as introduced Muharram and Ashura ceremonies. A number of Imam Bargahs were also built by the Bahmani kings. In this vein, many Shias arrived in India during this period. Many Hindus also converted to Islam. Through a period of 18 kings, the Bahmani Sultanate maintained rule of the Deccan. From 1490 onwards, five dynasties, which later came to be known as the Deccan Sultanates, broke away and claimed independence. They included the Adil Shahis and Nizam Shahis, and many years later, the Qutb Shahis. Now in power, they established Shiism as the de facto state religion, mirroring the Safavids in Iran. The Nizam Shahis of Ahmad Nagar were founded in 1490 by Ahmad Nizam al-Mulk, a Hindu convert. During their rule, a very notable figure emerged from Shah Tahir. Shah Tahir was a Shia scholar who made a deep impression on the Nizam Shahi king, Barhan Nizam Shah. After discussing various theological issues, the king arranged a polemic debate 
with other leading scholars. Shah Tahir successfully defeated the other scholars using their books after which the king converted to Shia Islam. Burhan Nizam Shah then made Shiaism the state religion and people converted in their thousands. This attracted many Shias to migrate to Ahmadnagar. In time, many migrating Shias were given respected posts in the government. The longest surviving Shia who ruled the state in Deccan was that of the Quli Qutb Shahis from 1512 to 1687. When the Bahmani kingdom began to disintegrate, Quli Qutb Shah claimed independence and established Golconda as his capital. Quli Qutb Shah, the founder, was an Iranian from Turkoman tribe. As Persian Shia observances such as Ashura were commemorated en masse, many great scholars, poets, historians, religious divines and Sufis from Iran were invited to settle down in the kingdom. This encouraged other Shia to migrate to Golconda, the capital. Various historians have left accounts narrating the zeal of the commemorations with mosques and Imam Bargas built to remember Imam Hussein alayhi salam. The Qutb Shahis were known to be highly educated, patronizing further learning in the arts and sciences, attracting many members of the Persian nobility to their kingdom. The height of the Qutb Shahi dynasty was during the reign of Muhammad Quli Qutb Shah, who moved the capital to an area known as Bhavnagar, after which he changed the name of the city to Hyderabad in reverence to Imam Ali. Muhammad Quli Qutb Shah appointed Allama Mir Muhammad Mu'min as his Prime Minister. Being an architect and a pious scholar, he was asked to design the city according to the Holy Quran. His master plan was based on the shrine of Imam Raza in Mashhad. He is most famously remembered for the Char Minar, an amazingly powerful architectural marvel that stands as another reminder of Shia rule in India. With four minarets, 56 meters high, it stands unique in its structure, with some commentators believing it was designed to replicate a ta'zia, a traditional model resembling the shrine of Imam Hussein in Karbala. With beautiful, intricate engravings, it brings together various different architectural styles that had come to be distinctive to the Quli Qutb Shahs. Inside the large dome, one finds engravings symmetrically positioned in the shape of an alam with the names of Allah, Muhammad and Ali. With all main roads leading towards the monument, one sees the architectural mastery employed by Muhammad Mir Mu'min. Adjacent to the Char Minar, one finds the Mecca Masjid. Again designed and built by Muhammad Mir Mu'min, the gigantic structure bears the hallmarks of the Quli Qutb style. It is unique in its cube-like structure resembling the Holy Kaaba itself. Completing the capital only a few meters away is Badshahi Ashur Khana, which is the oldest Imam Bargah in the city. Painstakingly detailed, the intricate design is actually a mosaic, revealing the quintessential Iranian design prevailing in the Safavid Iran at the time. Upon advice of the Mir Mu'min, the Sultanate declared the birth of Prophet Imam Ali and Eid al-Ghadir as days of public festivities. During the reign of Abdullah Qutb Shah, an important relic was brought from Karbala to Golconda. It is said that this relic was a piece of wooden plank upon which Lady Zainab was given her final ablution by her husband before burial. This relic was enshrined and preserved into a calligraphic alam 
with Arabic letters of Allah, Muhammad and Ali. It is said that this alam is the oldest in India. Annually, an iconic procession takes place during Muharram in which this alam is taken from Alawi Bibi in Dabirpur and installed in the name of Imam Hussain at Ashur Khana e Zahra in Darul Shifa. While Shias governed regions in the Deccan, in Delhi, a new kingdom was emerging. The Mughals were a powerful empire in the north of India who established their reign founded by Babur in the year 1526 when he defeated Ibrahim Lodhi, the last ruler of Delhi Sultanate in the first battle of Panipat. With a reign that lasted four years, Babur's eldest son Humayu became the second Mughal emperor in the year 1530. With a fierce army, he expanded the territories until he came against Sher Shah Suri, who attacked the empire from Bihar in the east. After a 10-year reign, Humayu had to flee, first to Kashmir, then Kabul, then to Tabriz, the capital of the Shia Safavi Empire in Iran. At that time, Shah Tamas Safavi was uh, ruling Iran and he received uh, Humayun with great warmth and uh, also not only warmth but he uh, promised that he would be helping Humayun to get back his uh, kingdom. Humayun stayed there for about two, 12 years and it was during that period that the impact and the influence of uh, Shia culture uh, was, uh, could be seen uh, on Humayun's mind. In the year 1555, Humayu marched back to Delhi with 12,000 Iranian Shia soldiers. Much had changed in Delhi since he had fled. The death of both Sher Shah Suri and his son Islam Suri left the Suri dynasty in disarray. This opened the way for Humayu and his Shia Persian army under the command of his trusted general Bayram Khan, a staunch Shia who also served under his father Babur. Retaking Delhi, the Mughal kingdom had restored its capital. However, Humayun did not live to enjoy his success long after. He died and was succeeded by his son Akbar from his wife Hamida Banu, a Persian Shia. With Akbar only 12 years of age, Bayram Khan was appointed to be the king's regent. When Akbar took over, then Bayram Khan was the, was the teacher and was the guardian or was the regent of Akbar. At that time, again, we see that a lot of Irani influence is there and people from Iran came here, settled down in all uh, walks of life. Bayram Khan commanded the Mughal forces in the Second Battle of Panipat when Himu, a Hindu emperor from north, thought it opportune to retake Delhi after the death of Humayun. With an inferior army, Bayram Khan outwitted Himu whose army of elephants couldn't break through the Mughal defences. And Himu was defeated, arrested and brought before Akbar. Akbar did not, Akbar refused to, to assassinate him, to kill him, but Bayram Khan did. And uh, Himu, Himu was as, uh, killed by Bayram Khan. So we see that uh, in all the stages, the, the impact of Shia, Shia help and Shia support is there in the Mughal Empire. The, the support of Ali Quli Khan Shibani, the support of Bayram Khan, and the support of uh, so many other uh, eminent generals, and also uh, the presence of so many eminent Shias in the court of Akbar is a clear proof that uh, the uh, Mughal Empire owed its existence due to the support of Shia community. Amongst all Mughal kings, the reign of Akbar the Great was the most unique and significant. Evidently, he preferred to be surrounded by Shias, who would play an influential role within his government. His mother, Hamida Banu, his regent, and his mentor, Bayram Khan, and an entourage of statesmen in his court were all Shia. Akbar's Nauratans, or the Nine Jewels, epitomized this reality. 
a composition of nine learned men who held a special place in Akbar's court, his inner circle, so to speak. Of them, four were Shia. They were Faizi, Abul Fazl, Abdul Rahim Khan Khana, son of Bayram Khan, and Orfi. Each were members of the elite ruling class of Persian Shia, who advised on social affairs and matters of state. The Mughals were right from Babur were never concerned about anybody's religion. They were more concerned about their political gains, their worldly aims. So the result was that right from the beginning, even in Humayun's nobility, you will find Shia nobles reaching the high ranks. And under Akbar, this trend further increased. During the period of Akbar, uh, we find that the Shias actually started coming into their own. It was during the reign of Akbar that a large number of Iranian migrants, not only nobles from Iran, but also merchant communities started migrating from the Safavid lands and they started uh, gravitating towards the Mughal court. Emperor Akbar was a devout follower of Shah Muinuddin Chisti, whose tomb he visited on foot every year. When his wife, Maryam Zamani Begum, was pregnant with Jahangir, he sent her to live in the Zawiya of Sheikh Salim Chisti and then named his son Salim upon his birth after the noble saint. Emperor Akbar, you know, he was illiterate, I mean, he, but when he, uh, when people recited the poetry of Rumi, he used to cry, you know. So it was really the poetry of Ishq that appealed to him. And he told his people that if you want to become better human beings, you have to read Rumi, you know. The aptitude and ability of the Shia during the Mughal period was further epitomized by Qazi Nurullah Shustari, also known as Shahid Salis. His story becomes an integral part of the Shia narrative in India as we know today. It was in 1585 that Qazi Nur Lashustari, who belonged to uh, a family of Marashi, uh, um, uh, you know, a theological uh, family, migrated to India. He came to Fatehpur Sikri, joined the court of Akbar. Akbar at this moment of time appointed him to go to Kashmir and carry out, you know, economic and social surveys out there as I have already pointed out. The brilliance of Qadi Nurullah was his ability to give judgments based on Shia fiqh while providing Sunni justification for them. Uh, what we come to know is that this was the period when the Shia theologians started openly professing their faith as well as writing books on Shis. In fact, Qadi Nurullah Shustari wrote Ihqaqul Haq, which was a uh, a counter to a large number of works which had been written as allegations against the Shi'i philosophy. We can say that Qazi Nurullah Shustari's works were the first in the Indian subcontinent which were taking cognizance of the attacks on Shi's. In fact, Qazi Nurullah uh, uh, Shustari goes on to argue that there is no place as good as Hindustan to profess the faith of Shis in India. The 16th century became a time when sectarian polemical discourse had reached a peak where works written against Shiism were becoming widespread throughout the Muslim lands. These books were making their way to India where the pressure on Shia community was growing. When Akbar passed away and Jahangir ascended the throne, the climate changed slightly. Many of the prominent Persian Shias who held sway in Akbar's court had either passed away or had resettled elsewhere, likely in the Deccan where Shias were taking control and ruling independently. In such a climate, the orthodox Sunnis were becoming increasingly prominent and influential. Qazi Nurullah, who had a senior post, was targeted by these individuals. They would frequently circulate his polemical writings to undermine his position. 
Soon, Qadi Nurullah found himself isolated as climate inside the court became unconducive. In 1610, at the age of 70, Qadi Nurullah was executed by flogging. Although the exact reason behind his execution is unclear, many speculations and reports have been made. One of the more prominent accounts state that he was executed for his polemical work, Ahqaq al-Haq, which defended Shia Islam. Ahqaq al-Haq was presented as evidence against him and he was declared a heretic. This piece of work would have borne Qazi Nurullah a number of enemies from the Sunni Orthodox who would have plotted against him. Their influence grew after Akbar's death and it is likely that they convinced Jahangir that Ahqaq al-Haq was a text that had divided the community, sowing seeds of enmity and disunity. Qazi Nurullah goes down in history as one of the most prominent figures who defended the faith like none other. The wife of Jahangir, Nur Jahan, was a key Shia figure during the reign of the Mughals. Nur Jahan was a strong, charismatic, well-educated woman who dominated their relationship. She became the most powerful and influential woman at the court for over 15 years when the Mughal Empire was at the peak of its power and glory. She was the only Mughal Empress to have coinage struck in her name and often held court independently when the Emperor was unwell. On most occasions, the Emperor sought her views on matters before issuing orders. Shiaism gained further ascendancy during this period with Muharram rituals being widely practiced. She goes down in history as one of the most prominent Shia influences on the great Mughal Empire. Another Shia empress who left her mark is Mumtaz Mahal, the wife of Jahangir's son, Shah Jahan. The emperor loved his wife so much that upon her passing, he commissioned the Shia Persian architect Ustad Ahmad Lahori to construct a tomb over her grave, a construction that took 21 years to build. The Taj Mahal is a world heritage site known as the jewel of Muslim art in India and one of the universally admired masterpieces of the world's heritage. The son of Mumtaz Mahal, Aurangzeb took over from his father. He was distinctly Sunni with orthodox tendencies, unlike his brothers and forefathers. Aurangzeb banned Shia rituals and practices commemorating the martyrdom of Imam Hussein. Aurangzeb was responsible for deaths of many Shias living in the Deccan Sultanate when he overthrew the Bijapur Sultanate. Similarly, he set his sights on Golconda and the Shia Qutb Shahis, affecting the fortunes of the Shias in that period and bringing to an end the Shia rule in the Deccan. During Aurangzeb's reign, the empire gained political strength once more, but his religious conservatism and intolerance undermined the stability of Mughal society. At his death in 1707, many parts of the empire were in open revolt. This gave rise to the emergence of several Shia kingdoms under the Mughal Empire. The Shia dynasty known as the Nawabs rose to power in 17th and 18th century in the regions of Awadh, Rampur and West Bengal, where they constructed many Imam Bargahs, mosques and greatly encouraged the commemorations of Muharram. The greatest impact on the development of Shiism in the subcontinent was made by the 135 years of Shia rule in Awadh. In 1722, Muhammad Amin Musavi, the Mughal governor of Awadh, obtained de facto independence from the Mughals. He was a Persian Shia whose wealthy aristocratic family descended from Imam Musa al kadhim He declared Shiism as the religion of the state and spent generously on the development of Shia seminaries. The Nawabs of Awadh paid great respect to the shrine cities in Iraq and bestowed on them enormous amounts in patronage. This period marked the renewal of Shia rule in India. Huge sums of money were spent on constructing Imam Bargahs, mosques 
and replica shrines where the commemoration of Muharram attracted people of all faiths. These were formalized like never before under the rule of Asif ud after he moved the capital of Awadh state from Faizabad to Lucknow. His ambitions to rival Mughal architecture led to his construction of the Asafi Imam Bargah and mosque complex. Unique in every way, they stand as a reminder of Shia authority and opulence in days gone by. Nawab Asif ud is buried inside Imam Bargah and immortalized for his contribution to the Shia narrative of India. Nawab Asif ud he was the main mentor as far as the Lucknow is concerned and the spreading of Shiaism amongst different sections of society and different communities, different religions. Like Asif ud later Nawab spent abundantly on the commemoration of Muharram and remembrance of the Ahlul Bayt. They built like for like replicas of the tombs for the Ahlul Bayt. For the vast majority of Shias unable to travel to Iraq to visit the holy shrines, these replicas provided an opportunity for them to pay their homage and respect. As Nawabs were adherent Shia, many of those living under them also embraced the Shia faith. The replica shrines also attracted people from other faiths providing them a space for worship. Shia teachings and practices were also spread through poetry and public recitations of eulogies and marsiyas in praise and commemoration of the Ahlul Bayt and their tragedies. Particularly, the martyrdom of Imam Hussein alayhi salam. Poets were generously patronized and even a number of Nawabs could write poems in remembrance of the Ahlul Bayt. Having said that, Mir Babar Ali Anis is a significant figure in this regard. He is widely held for his timeless poems praising the Ahlul Bayt. They have been recited by people of different faiths to this day. In this way, Poetry and Marsiya recitations became an integral wheel in the spread of the love of the Ahlul Bayt. The Nawabs patronized hundreds of scholars who would join the seminaries for further religious learning. The most prominent of these scholars is Ayatollah Sayyid Dildar Ali Nasir Abadi, who reached the status of Ijtihad after studying for many years in Najaf and Qom. On return to Lucknow in 1755, he established the first ever Shia Friday prayer in India and he introduced the foundations for the Usuli jurisprudential school. From there, Shiism gained a real ascendancy. He authored a number of books, including Imad al Islam, his magnum opus, a theological work where he refutes the opinions of Fakhruddin al Razi, the leading Sunni theologian. Today, the direct descendant and spokesman for the Shia community in Lucknow, Sayyid Kalbe Jawad, continues the legacy of his ancestor Ayatollah Sayyid Dildar Ali and leads the Friday prayers in Asafi Masjid. Sayyid Dildar Ali of Ramab came back from Najaf and established the powerful Hoza in Lucknow. And basically, the Marja are now from the Lucknow at that time. غفران ماب علیہ رحمہ نے اسی زمین پر مدرسہ اپنا قائم کیا جو مدرسہ اجتہاد کے نام سے جانا گیا جس سے انہوں نے سیکڑوں طالب علم تیار کر کے پورے ہندوستان میں شیعت کی تبلیغ اور ازاداری کی ترویج کے لیے پھیلا دیئے اور کچھ اپنے خاص شاگردوں کو یہیں روکا اپنے بیٹوں کو اپنے ساتھ رکھا ان کے پانچوں بیٹے مجتہد ان کے شاگرد کئی مجتہد کچھ لوگوں کو انہوں نے اجازہ اجتہاد بھی دیا جو ان کی معاونت اور علمی کارواں میں ان کی مدد کرتے رہے آیت اللہ دلدار علی غفران معاب لیفٹ بہائنڈ اے کلچر آف جورس پروڈینشل لرننگ ان لکھنو ویریس ڈفرنٹ ہاؤزاز و اسٹیبلش انیبلنگ اسٹوڈنٹس ٹو انرول اینڈ گین فرام دس رسپیکٹڈ اسکالر یہ اجتہاد امام بارگاہ اینڈ گریو یارڈ وچ واز یوز ایز اے سینٹر ٹو ٹیچ بائی آیت اللہ Dildar Ali later became a research institute. The graveyard hosts the graves of great scholars and mujtahids, including the body of Ayatollah Dildar Ali Ghofran Ma'ab himself. Today, many visit this site and pay their respects to the servant of Allah. 
اس میں تقریباً تیس سے زیادہ مشتہد دفن ہیں تقریباً تقریباً ایک درجن سے زیادہ جو ہے مرج تقلید اس امام باڑے میں دفن ہے شاید ہندوستان میں اتنا قیمتی دوسرا امام باڑا نہیں ہے This culture of Shia learning spread to other areas of the country with various hausas established to produce scholars and ulama who would then propagate Shia Islam to the masses. The oldest running hausa today is the Imamiya Hausa in Varanasi, the spiritual home of Hinduism where millions of pilgrims bathe in the river Ganges. A few streets away, you also have Jawadiya Hausa. In Lucknow, The most prominent Hausa still operating is the Nazimiya Hausa. Here students of all ages undergo religious learnings under the tutelage of Sayyid Hamidul Hassan. Students from all over India come here to study religious sciences and often continue in Najaf and Qom before returning back to preach the masses. Here in the teaching, the first of the teaching was the first مولانا فرمان علی صاحب تھے جنہوں نے پہلا ترجمہ قرآن یہاں کیا اردو میں ان کے ساتھیوں میں تھے مولانا سی سبت حسن صاحب اور ایک مولانا شبیر صاحب ہوتے تھے یہ سب دس سال بارہ سال پڑھ کر ان کو آخری ڈگری دی گئی ممتاز اللہ فاضل کی یہ ممتاز اللہ فاضل ایک آخری ڈگری کہلاتی ہے جو سب سے پہلے مدارے سے دینی یا ہندوستان میں جاری ہوئی Despite the numbers and the ongoing classes, the current system of learning is a far stretch from the height at which Lucknow once was. The Lucknow Hausa never reached the heights of Najaf or Qom. However, they managed to produce scholars of similar caliber. In the late 19th century, one of the most notable was Mir Hamid Hussain, a renowned jurist and theologian who became most famous for his book, Abaqat al-Anwar fi Imamat al-Aimat al-Athar, a reply written in Persian against the polemic book At-Tuhfat al-Ithna Ashari by Shah Abdul Aziz al-Dehlavi. Mir Hamid Hussain dedicates his book to defending the concepts of Imama looking at two key sources, the Quran and Hadith. While his work on Hadith has been published, his work based on the Quran still remains in handwritten form. Mir Hamid Hussain had also worked tirelessly to gather original manuscripts of key religious texts and hadith collections. They are now collected in what is known as Nasiriya Library. Here, there was a book written by Tofa Is Nasiriya, which was written by Shia Masab. The answer was written by my father. My father had written by Shawar Qudusus, the Prophet of the Prophet of the Prophet of the Prophet. ان کے بیٹے حامد حسین صاحب نے اس کے جواب میں ابقات اسی کے بعد ابقات الانبار لکھی جو بہت زیادہ مشہور ہوئی اور بلایت علی ابن ابی طالب کے سلسلے میں سب سے بڑی سورس بک مانی جاتی ہے وہ آیت اللہ عبد الحسین امینی نے جب الغدیر لکھی تو پھر ان کو یہاں تشریف لائے اور لمبے عرصے یہاں کام کرتے رہے اور ان کو میرے والد کتابیں نکال نکال کے دیتے رہے اس سے انہوں نے حوالے مرتب کیے الغدیر لکھی The Nawabs of Abad seized power of Rampur with military assistance of British East India Company as they defeated and drove the Rohilas out of their former capital of Bareilly in Rampur This was established by Faizullah Khan in 1774 The key figure during the reign of the Nawabs of Rampur was Nawab Kalbe Ali Khan, who was literate in Arabic and Persian. Under his rule, the state did much to uplift standards of education. He is also known for building the Jama Masjid in Rampur at the cost of 300,000 rupees. Nawab Hamid Ali became the new ruler in 1889 at the age of 14. Many new schools were opened during his reign and lots of donations were provided to nearby colleges. He donated 50,000 rupees to Lucknow Medical College and in 1905 he built the magnificent Darbar Hall within the fort which now houses the great collection of rare manuscripts held by the Rampul Raza Library. According to the Raza Library, 
One of his richest and finest collections are the early 7th century Qurans, which are said to be handwritten personally by Imam Ali, Imam al-Sadiq, and Imam Ali al-Radha, peace be upon them all. Raza Ali Khan became the last ruling Nawab in 1930. On 1st of July 1949, the state of Rampur was merged into the Republic of India. Rampur today presents a slightly decayed appearance. The palaces of the Nawabs are crumbling, as are the gates and walls of the fort. However, the library remains a flourishing institution of immense value to scholars from all over the world. In the early 18th century, the Nawab Nazims of Bengal arose. An important figure during rule of the Nawabs of Bengal was Mirza Muhammad Sirajuddaula, who built the old Nizamat Imam Bara. He is said to have bought bricks on mortar and laid foundations of the buildings with his own hands. The old Medina Mosque, which still stands today, near the Big Ben of Murshidabad was built on a plot that was dug to a depth of six feet and refilled with the soil brought from Mecca so that the poor members of the Muslim community could have an experience of Hajj. When old Nizamat Imam Bar caught fire, Nawab Nazim Mansur Ali Khan built the present Nizamat Imam Bar also widely known as the biggest Imam Bara in India. Today, Nizamat Imam Bara is an impressive piece of architecture being 680 feet long. It stands opposite the Hazardwari Palace situated on the banks of the Hooghly River. 200 kilometers south of Hazardwari Palace of Murshidabad is Hooghly Imam Barga, an architectural splendor of 19th century. Its construction was initiated by Muhammad Mohsin in 1841. Located by the western bank of the Hooghly River, it stands with fading grandeur, whispering story of its glorious past. A particularly outstanding aspect of this Imam Barga is its clock, which is placed at the middle of the twin towers erected upon the doorway of the main entrance. The huge clock was brought by Sayyid Karamat Ali, which was manufactured by Messrs. Black and Hare Company, the same makers as that of Big Ben in London. Another architectural marvel which is based in the heart of Hyderabad is the Azahana Zahra. The magnificent structure built by the Nizam Mir Usman Ali Khan to perpetuate the memory of his mother, Amatu Zahra Begum, in the year 1941. The Nizam himself was a Sunni Muslim, however, his mother was a Shia who he dearly loved. Azahana Zahra was initiated by a group of dedicated members of Shia community who wanted to mark the 1300th anniversary of the martyrdom of Imam Hussain. They struggled to raise the funds needed but found in Mir Usman a man who was grieving and generous. Today, Azahana Zahra hosts programs of commemoration and lamentations during all events, welcoming up to 10,000 mourners at a time. Mir Usman Ali Khan was last and the seventh Nizam to rule Hyderabad. The first Nizams ruled on behalf of the Mughal emperors. After the death of Aurangzeb, they split from the Mughals to form an independent kingdom. In this way, the period of Mughal dominance diminished into a myriad of governor kings that each ruled their territory somewhat independently. In a similar way, there were certain Hindu rulers maintaining control of few pockets of lands. However, the days of dominant Muslim rule had subsided. In this climate, the ever-expansionist British crown turned its attention toward the subcontinent via the East India Company, a trading presence which had signed an agreement with the Mughal Emperor Jahangir in the beginning of 7th century. The merchant group eventually came to rule large areas of the country with its own private armies, exercising military control and assuming administrative functions, especially over the rich provinces of West Bengal. 
Siraj Dola was the final Nawab to rule over Bengal before it fell into the hands of the British East India Company. Although Lucknow remained the religious centre of Shiism in India throughout the East India Company's rule, the Shia kingdoms became weakened, limiting the propagation and development of Shiism in the country. Many ulama of Awadh also participated in the revolt in 1850s, after which the British crowns officially stepped in and established the British Raj. Shias were quick to respond to reconciliation attempts with the British, with a number of Shia tax collectors keeping large land holdings from the former Awadh kingdom, and patronage to Shia ulama and institutions continuing, albeit on a much smaller scale. Two decades after 1858 revolt proved specially ruinous for Shiism in northern India, especially in the city of Lucknow, the former Nawabi capital. The city's largest Shia mosque, the Asafi Masjid, and their joining Asafud Dora, Imam Barga, Lucknow's most imposing villages buildings, were converted into British military garrisons. Over 50 other city mosques were appropriated to uses including offices, police depots, medical dispensaries, and stables for livestock. New land settlement policies, rewritten in 1858 around principles of perceived loyalty to the British Raj, shut off stipends of inherited land revenue on which many noble Shia families and villager scholars had depended. Visits to India by Arab and Persian scholars, artists and physicians, commonplace under the Nawabs became less so, while the profile of Indian ulama in Shia clerical centers such as Najaf reciprocally dried up. There was a diminishment in funding and the two to three decades after 1857 were an era of weakness and disorder for Indian Shiism. As India neared independence, communities that coexisted for centuries began descending towards a sectarian civil war with Hindus and Sikhs on one side and Muslims on the other. The carnage was specially intense in Punjab and Bengal, both provinces abutting India's border with Pakistan. This led to the partition of the country along sectarian lines. Though two-thirds of the Muslims now reside in Pakistan, a third remained in India. The partition brought with its religious fury and violence causing deaths of two million Hindus, Muslims and Sikhs with over 10 million people forcibly transferred between the two states. Under new and inexperienced government, poverty and overpopulation grew out of control. The British have long been criticized for their role in the lead up to the partition of India. From as early as 18th century, the British treated the Muslims and Hindus differently, never as one community. This included jobs, education, community buildings, political aspirations, as well as the use of caste system to entrench divides within the wider community. When this descended into sectarian violence that claimed millions of lives, particularly in Punjab and Bengal, the British did little to limit the tensions. This continued until the end of the Second World War, at which the British were struggling to maintain their colonies around the world. In 1947, an Act of Parliament finally confirmed the transfer of power into the hands of India, a country still plagued by widespread sectarian discord and severe economic woes. Muhammad Ali Jinnah, a Shia of Hoja ancestry, was the leader of the Muslim League at the time, had been calling for an independent Muslim state for decades. He had long cooperated with the British and after a short while, British lawyer Cyril Ratcliffe was entrusted to legalize the partition of India. On August 14, 1947, Pakistan and India were now independent state with Hoja Shia Muhammad Ali Jinnah, the founding father of Pakistan, who served as the Governor General until his death in September 1948. A significant number of members of the All India Muslim League, which struggled for independence, were Shia. Prominent amongst them were Sayyid Wazir Hassan, Sayyid Karamat Hussain, Hamid Ali Khan, Raja Sayyid Abu Jafar of Pirpur, Maharaja Sir Muhammad Ali Muhammad Khan of Mahmudabad, Sir Sayyid Ali Imam, Sayyid Hassan Imam, Nawab Hamid Ali Khan of Rampur, Sayyid Amir Ali, Agha Khan, Muhammad Amir Ahmad Khan, the last Raja of Mahmudabad, and above all, Muhammad Ali Jinnah.
دیکھیے آزادی کے بعد جو ہے وہ وہ زمینداری جو ختم کر دی گئی تو شیعہ بہت بڑے بڑے زمیندار تھے اور ان سے مدرسے جڑے ہوئے تھے ان سے جو علمی خان والے تھے ان سے جڑے ہوئے تھے جب زمینداری ختم ہو گئی تو ایک دم سے غریبی آ گئی ایک دم سے پاورٹی آ گئی جس کی وجہ سے شیعوں کو بہت بڑا نقصان پہنچا بہت بڑا نقصان پہنچا ہے اور اس کے بعد جو ہندوستان پاکستان میں بٹوارہ ہوا تو بہت سے علماء ہمارے پاکستان چلے گئے بہت سے جو اچھے لوگ تھے وہاں چلے گئے تو اس سے بھی شیعوں کو بہت بڑا نقصان پہنچا ہے اس بٹوارے کے بعد بھی ون آف دا سیڈ تھنگز دیٹ ہیپن واز سیڈ فار آس از دیٹ اے نمبر آف پیپل فرام دس ریجن مائگریٹڈ ٹو پاکستان اینڈ دے ٹینڈیڈ ٹو بی فرام دی ایلیٹ اینڈ آئی مین بائی ایلیٹ از ناٹ a class elite, but an intellectual elite also. So poets, lawyers, engineers, doctors, and so on, they all went to Pakistan and to Karachi in particular. Uh, and that left a vacuum here. Uh, some families stayed, by, stayed back. Um, my, my grandmother stayed here and my father uh, stayed in India. But th the families were few and far between. And because uh, culture, obviously, to this day, um, whether it's Western culture or aspects of you know, modern art and so on, all these things require patronage. And what happened with the colonial period and then uh, the post-colonial period after independence was that old structures of patronage um, disappeared. And so a lot of the arts, a lot of the skills, a lot of the literature, a lot of the people who were keeping these things alive were often made to, um, to for example, uh, push a rickshaw for a living. اور <laughs> In this way, they lack a coherent formation and remain weak politically and economically. Access to education and poverty are amongst many widespread issues today. The first disease is the disease, the second disease is the disease. From the first disease, the Shia has a lot of diseases from these two diseases. In Lakhnou, you can see the conditions in Lakhnou. You can see the conditions in Bengal. You can see the conditions in the Shia. The conditions in the Shia are so bad that you cannot even imagine about their poverty. The conditions in the Shia are so bad that you cannot You cannot even imagine about their poverty. There are innumerable organizations in India aiming to help the community, amongst which charity-funded orphanages play a vital role in providing care, housing and education to destitute children. There are also many Shia schools in India, as well as colleges that have established to help the poor families while providing religious education in an Islamic environment. Education is at the heart of the efforts to revive the strength and influence of the Shia community. This includes the renowned Aligarh Muslim University, which was founded by Sayyid Ahmad Khan, which was patronized by members of all faith, including the Shia community, particularly by Maharaja Sir Muhammad Ali Muhammad Khan of Mahmudabad. The Department of Shia Theology of the Aligarh Muslim University is the only specialized center of Shia studies in India. and is held in high esteem, not only in India, but also in Iran, Iraq, and other countries. The history of Shiism in India dates back a thousand years. Despite its small population, its footprint has left a distinct and indelible mark on a country which is home to a number of creeds and religions. This is epitomized by the fact that Ashura is a national holiday where no trade or teaching takes place. Hindus, Sikhs, Buddhists, Sunnis, and even people of no religion commemorate the martyrdom of Imam Hussain In a similar way, other faiths and creeds have also contributed significantly, creating a melting pot of cultures and ideas. This becomes distinctly evident when visiting the replica shrines, Imam Bargaz, Ashur Khanas and Husseiniyas up and down the country. The colors, symbolisms and visual manifestations are integral. The alams, tazias of replica shrines are everywhere, allowing a distinct sensual relationship between the devotee and the place of worship. This dynamic is seen in other temples, dargahs and places of worship from different religions within the country. Shiyo ke taluqat to dusre mazhab ke log hain unse bahut achhe hain. 
خاص طور سے ازاداری کی وجہ سے کیونکہ ازاداری میں اتنا اٹریکشن ہے کہ جس کی وجہ سے ہندو بھی ہمارے پاس آتے ہیں سکھ بھی آتے ہیں دوسرے لوگ بھی آتے ہیں ایک تو پہلی وجہ تو یہ ہے کہ یہاں مشہور یہ ہے وہاں بھی کہ امام حسین نے امام حسین علیہ السلام نے فرمایا تھا وہاں پر کہ مجھے ہندوستان جانے دو وہاں میں اپنی زندگی گزارنا چاہتا ہوں تو یہاں ہندو میں یہ مشہور ہے کہ امام حسین نے کہا تھا میں ہندوستان آنا چاہتا ہوں دوسری چیز ہے کہ یہاں بھی یہ بھی مشہور ہے کہ کچھ ہندو حضرات بھی وہاں گئے تھے کربلا میں امام حسین کی مدد کے لیے یہاں پر ایک سیکٹ ہے حسینی برہمن حسینی برہمن وہ کہتے ہیں کہ ہمارے جو فور فادرز تھے وہ کربلا گئے تھے امام حسین کی مدد کرنے کے لیے تو اس کا مطلب ایک ریلیشن ہے کربلا سے اور انڈیا کا ریلیشن ہے جس کی وجہ سے ہندو راجا جو ہیں وہ بھی محرم مناتے تھے بنارس کے ہندو راجا وہ محرم مناتے تھے گوالیر کے ہندو راجا وہ محرم مناتا تھا اندور کے ہندو راجا وہ محرم مناتے تھے جھانسی کی رانی محرم مناتی تھی کوئی وہاں پر مسلمانوں کا وہاں پر گزری نہیں اس کے بعد بھی وہ محرم منت آج بھی پانچ محرم کو ان کا جھانسی رانی کے تازیہ اٹھتا ہے وہاں سے ان کے محل سے کوئی ان کو مطلب یہاں شیو سے کوئی ریلیشن نہیں تھا لیکن یہ کہ یہ چیزیں پہنچی ہوئی جس کی وجہ سے ان کو ایک اٹریکشن پیدا ہوا امام حسین سے اور خاص طور سے وہاں کے جو ٹریجک ایونٹس ہیں اس کی وجہ سے یہاں کے لوگ متاثر ہوئے اس سے جس کی وجہ سے ہندو بڑی تعداد میں آج بھی محرم مناتا ہے Interestingly, the Hindus themselves, the Dalit women, have developed their own set of rituals to commemorate um, Muharram. So, for instance, on the 9th uh, of Muharram at night, uh, they take off their shoes um, and they walk for until uh, Asr uh, on the 10th of Muharram on Ashura. They don't stop, they don't sit, uh, they don't eat, they don't drink. And all they do is they have an oral tradition of poetry and they recite these poems. They say, well, we believe that Baba Hussain Uh, uh, was one of us, one of the oppressed. And obviously, the, it's the oppression which resonates with the Dalits, right? Because they are the lowest caste. They have suffered for 5,000 years. It is quite clear that over time, the society, its cultures and its norms have rubbed off on the migrating nations and their rituals. But what's unique is the way in which the indigenous faith groups also come to the Shia replica shrines and Imam Baras to pray and worship in the name of the Imam. Now heed what happened on that awesome day of martyrdom, what grief and sorrow and what tribulations then befell. Those thirsty, starving, steadfast souls devoted thus to God who sacrificed their precious lives in service to his cause. Each one of them was such a faithful friend without power. There never will be such a Lord, nor ever followers such. Majra subh shahadat ka bayan karta hoon Ranjo andoho musibat ka bayan karta hoon Tashnakamo ki ibadat ka bayan karta hoon Janisaron ki itaat ka bayan karta hoon جن کا ہمتا نہیں ایک ایک مصاحب ایسا ایسے بندے نہ کبھی ہوں گے نہ صاحب ایسا